Welcome to day three uh, to me, uh, Premier Flux. And um, it's my really tremendous pleasure to introduce our uh, uh, plenary, uh, fourth plenary talk speaker, and that is uh, Professor Jennifer Cole from Northwestern University. And the reason we invited her is because in the form form side, we call it in the phonetics phonology side, Jennifer has one of the most innovating and exciting programs of research on how the structure of linguistic pronunciation serves to structure meaning. In fact, we were, when we uh, had the idea of growing meaning flux to include pronunciation, well, first of all, it was from a, a, a realization that with that, with that every time we would get, we, we, we would be talking about deeper things, then we had to say, yeah, but what about prosody? <laughs> every time. And I said, okay, let's just, you know, come out and acknowledge it. Let's embrace this. And uh, when we were thinking about, okay, who, who would be fearless enough to come and talk to us and share with us? And Jennifer, your name came up. Huh? Oh. She's wearing <laughs> So, here is her one-liner. This is what she says. The two reviewer comments below were for a paper that eventually had a satisfying outcome, but which also went through a lot, went through a complete rewrite during the review process, and which, uh, which was many, many months in preparation. And I really loved this, uh, this uh, preamble because it is so true, at least from my experience, and when the review process is good, and it is productive, it's, it's wonderful, it's transformational. And so you have these anonymous people who are uh, turning into your teachers and telling you, but you, know, you can do better, and you can do it better in this direction. So, yeah. So uh, the reviewer comment on the initial submission was, Overall, this reviewer is under the impression that the text is at times rather superficial and not sufficiently nuanced in how particular phenomena are being discussed. Blah, 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 blah. The added value of this paper compared to what is being discussed in earlier publications was not sufficiently clear to me. So kind. <laughs> <laughs> Review comment on revised and ultimately accepted submission. The revision is impressive. <laughs> so that's it, Jennifer. Take it away. I left out some of the sort of less friendly parts here. <laughs> okay, I think I go. Thank you for inviting me. This has been a really exciting um, past couple of days uh, for the reason that I don't usually get to commune with people who aren't working on the sound side of language. And, um, and it's important, right, especially for somebody who works on prosody because this is very much an interface phenomenon. I actually think all of language is interface. But uh, you just can't avoid it at all when you work on prosody. And so it's really important that we talk with uh, people who are not working on sound issues and hear about their uh, research dilemmas and challenges and the methods that they use. So this has been really, really wonderful for me. Not only that, but um, it's wonderful to be back on this campus. This is the first uh, place where I taught after I had my PhD. Uh, and, um, and so it has a special place in my heart. And I just want to say that it was, uh, I, felt, I feel so fortunate to have been able to work under the uh, mentorship of senior colleagues like Larry Horn, um, who remains a friend to this day. Um, so it's a really nice homecoming. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the listener's dilemma, and I'm going to start out uh, with, uh, we're going to have some sound examples to play. Uh, I will have sound examples to play for you during this presentation. Well, let's just start out with the first one. It affects me now, and since I've been home. 
Okay, I'm a bit clipped a little at the beginning. I'm going to play it again and tell you that this is a, an excerpt from a conversation, uh, actually sort of an, an interview-style conversation with a young 25-year-old uh, speaker from Ohio. This is part of the Buckeye Corpus, a publicly available corpus. Whoops. I think the main thing that affects me now and since I've been home. Okay, so the thing that I want to draw your attention to in this utterance and that I'm going to be focusing on uh, quite a bit throughout my talk is the phenomenon of prominence, which is we can understand in a kind of atheoretic sense, it's just that within an utterance, some word or words will stand out a little bit more in your, in your awareness, in your perception. And um, the question that I'm asking is, well, which word, what is that phenomenon? Which words, how does it get decided? How are listeners perceiving it? Are all listeners perceiving it the same way? And what meaning do they, do they make out of this? All languages have uh, use uh, prominence modulation. All languages have prominence modulation. So we can ask this question of any language. Today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, research that I've done on English. But the phenomenon uh, is common to other languages, though the manifestation is different in different languages. So, um, uh, so in this phrase, we can ask which words did you hear as prominent? Uh, I've sort of indicated through my transcription over the pitch track that you can see here, which words kind of stood out to me. And, and a lot of them are located in regions where the pitch is moving, but not necessarily. And one of the questions that, um, that prosody researchers uh, focus on, particularly for English and Germanic languages, is, well, what's the, what's the nature of the pitch contour? And how does it relate to other properties of the acoustic signal that give rise to our impressions of prominence? Well, we know a lot about prominence um, in English and in German, Germanic languages in particular. A lot of work has been done. And we know that there are two factors in particular that contribute to uh, the speaker's production of prominence and the, and the listener's uh, perception of prominence. These are not the only two factors, but these are two factors that have received a lot of intense linguistic investigation. So one of them has to do with structure, and the other one has to do with information. And let's just uh, see how this has been described for English. So the structural factor that's relevant for English, which you need to know about, is the, the factor of phrasal stress. Uh, and so in a neutral discourse context, which that's a pitiful statement in itself, <laughs> uh, but I'm just going to use it and keep using it, um, but this should be a, a conversation that needs to take place outside of my talk. What the hell is a neutral discourse context? It's supposed to be the out of the blue. You walk into a room and you just say, I bought a blue. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, the fact that there's a pronoun I there already says that this is not a neutral discourse context. But, but please um, grant me the liberty to, um, to not focus on that for this talk. Um, so in this uh, fictional neutral discourse context, context in English, phrasal stress is assigned to the right most stressable word. And this is called the nucleus or the, or the nuclear stress. So in this sentence, it's poodle. And I think you can hear it if I produce it for you. I bought a poodle. Now, phrasal stress also marks information that's new to the discourse. And so if your sentence is such and the discourse context is such that the phrase final word is discourse given, then it should not be marked for phrasal stress. And so in this sentence, I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a poodle. The final stressable word is poodle. When I say stressable, I just mean this is a word that has lexical stress. It's not a function word. It can be. It can receive a phrasal stress. The final word is poodle in red. Um, but um, oh, I just realized I didn't take my laser pointer. Uh, oh well. Okay. Um, I packed it. Brought the extra battery for it. <laughs> Pretty sure it's sitting back in the hotel. Uh, that's okay. Um, so uh, you can use your finger. Yes. <laughs> later, I can do that now. It's a good pointer. Later. later. Or the, 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 oh, you're an angel. Thank you so much. Just, do you need to? Uh, this one right here. Okay. No, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so here's Thank poodle. You there's another poodle. So the second poodle is lexically given, um, uh, if referentially distinct, um, and so it shouldn't be stressed. And it sounds weird if you stress this to an English speaker who say, "I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a poodle." That's, that's a little bit infelicitous. 
uh, or maybe not, you're going to hear later today, uh, a talk by Jeff Geiger, uh, and he's going to talk about whether uh, sort of this accessibility of prior, based on prior mention or, or inferability is actually a basis for deep accenting. Jeff, was he here? Yeah. Hi. Okay, call up to Jeff. All right. Um, so, uh, so we talked talk so far about prominence, but I've also made uh, pointed to uh, pitch modulation. So let's see how these things come together. In English, uh, phrasal stress licenses pitch movements that we'll call pitch accent. And different um, pitch accents, uh, different whether the pitch is rising or falling or reaching higher low targets, are used according to the information status of a word and its focus status relevant to salient semantic alternatives. And so it, uh, a sort of traditional textbooky uh, description of English intonation would say that if your word uh, in the nuclear stress position has new and is presenting new information, then it should get a high pitch accent where the, the pitch is, is sort of uh, gradually rising up to a peak on the stress syllable of that word. But if your word is um, uh, has contrastive focus, and so the referent is being, uh, in particular, distinguished from a set of a salient semantic alternatives, then it should get this different pitch movement, which is also a rising pitch to a, to a high uh, pitch peak, but the rise is steeper, the peak is probably, in fact, almost certainly higher, and, um, and there should be this little elbow or turning point, so the rise really starts more precisely on the stress syllable. And, and so that's called the contrastive focus marking pitch accent. And then there are others. In fact, the full inventory of pitch accent types for English is, uh, I counted this up the other day, uh, probably eight, eight different pitch accents. And this is just two. And they're supposed to all be associated with different types of distinctions in information structure meaning. So uh, the claim has been made that pitch accents in English function as pragmatic morphemes. We're going to change if it's focused, if it's new, or if it's given. And I'm going to argue against this. Okay. So that's the spoiler. Let's just see how this works though with an example. So here's a sentence. Terry phoned the reporter. Reporter is the word with the, new, with the phrasal stress. And so if this sentence is offered in response to the question, how is the story leaked? Well, then the word reporter, which is stressable, and at the end of the sentence is also carrying new information. And so it should get that gently rising high star pitch accent from the reporter. Um, if, however, the same sentence is offered as an answer to the question, did Terry phone the police, then um, reporter has contrastive focus. It's, it's not police, but reporter. And so it should get a different pitch accent. Uh, no, the answer would be Terry phone the reporter. Um, and contrastive focus can be in other places in the sentence. It doesn't have to be on the final word. Uh, and so here, if, this, if our sentence is offered in response to the question, did Rita leak the story? Now Terry has contrastive focus, not reporter. Uh, reporter is still new information, but it's not contrastive focus. And contrastive focus will get the, um, uh, the rule in English is that if there's a word in the sentence with contrastive focus, that has to get the nuclear stress. So nuclear stress is moved all the way to the beginning, and this sentence would be Terry from reporter. Now, um, if these patterns, though, as I've described them, seem pretty straightforward. You could have a nice decision procedure to plant all of your pitch accents. But it turns out that trying to find evidence for these patterns in speech production has been a really big challenge for the field, at least whether we're looking for that evidence in uh, naturalistic speech materials from speech corpora, or whether we're trying to elicit and capture those beasts in our laboratory. The evidence has been hard to come by, and I'm going to review one of our studies just to make this point clear. This is, I think, something that it, I get the impression that this is not uh, well appreciated in the in the sort of on the meaning side when people are talking about uh, the prosodic expression of some of these different important pragmatic and semantic <laughs> meaning distinctions. Uh, that for English, these distinctions are not reliably present in the speech signal, and in fact. It's embarrassing how infrequently present they are. <laughs> we need to have a different conversation. So I'm trying to start that conversation today. Um, so we already know, in fact, Prosody researchers already know that, that the production evidence is uh, very challenging, to say the least. Um, but my talk today is actually going to focus on the listener. What the heck does the listener do when so much important information is 
allegedly, and almost certainly coming through this channel, this international channel, um, and yet it's so variable. What do they do? And so talk about listener uncertainty and in interpreting intonation as a cue to information structure in particular. Now, in case you haven't thought a lot about uh, prosody or intonation in English in particular, I want to underscore that today I'm really only talking about prominence and its relation to information structure. And there's a lot of other interesting work that intonation does, for example, distinguishing questions from statements. And, and I'm, I'm not going to be talking about that at all. However, all of the same problems arise in, that, in those other domains of the form function mapping, beyond the, the one that I'm sort of narrowly focused on right now. Um, OK, and I should just say as an aside, like I didn't start out as a prosody researcher. I started out as a phonologist, and I was interested in phonological variation at the segment level, and what kind of factors can account for it, because I was doing collaborative research with a speech engineer who was trying to see whether he could get better speech recognition if he had a good model of what they call pronunciation variation. So I thought maybe we need to look at some of the things that make words get pronounced differently in different contexts. Let's look at prosody. So I ex started to explore and just discovered that you know uh, that there's a lot of uh, a lot that we don't understand that I didn't understand, um, and I that was 25 years ago. 20 years ago, <laughs> I haven't got yet to the real question, which was how this prosody condition <laughs> is, uh, changes in pronunciation. Um, so similarly, I'm focused kind of narrowly on prominence and information structure right now because because there are bigger a broader field of questions for me to answer, but I'm just like still really struggling with this question, and so I'll, I'll move on, and some generation of people after me will, will move on and capture more. So this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some evidence from speech production for this massive variability. I'm going to spend more time talking about evidence from speech, uh, experiments investigating the perception and comprehension of, discourse, of, of intonation and its relation to discourse meaning. And then at the very end, I'm going to uh, tell you what I think is maybe a promising um, alternative way of thinking about it, the form function mapping um, for intonation. Okay, so do speakers use intonation to signal information structure? This was a question that I set out to explore um, have, after having uh, really struggled with um, analyses of naturalistic data from speech corpora. I decided to just retreat to the lab and see if I can design a really cleanly structured, tightly controlled experiment uh, where I know what the factors are and see what we come up with. So with my uh, former postdoc, Eleanor Shelgraf, we did a bunch of experiments, and here's one of them. We thought we, we, we asked our participants to read aloud these little stories, and with the, each story is uh, made up of three sentences. So the first sentence sets the stage. The third sentence is our, is our target sentence, and it's the final word of that sentence that we are going to take a lot of measurements from, because that's the word where we should expect the, the nuclear accent and, and all the intonational stuff happening. And we're manipulating the information structure of this final word by what goes on in the second sentence. So this story is going to come in four different versions, which differ in the second sentence only, setting up different information structure conditions. So in this example, uh, the word robbery in the final sentence is lexically and, uh, and referentially given because it's mentioned in the preceding sentence. Uh, in this version of the story, the second sentence is changed, so now the word robbery doesn't appear, but the semantically related and referentially related word crimes does occur, and so that makes the word robbery inferable or semantically accessible. And so the expectation, well, I'll tell you about what the expectations are in the next slide, but that's a different information structure condition. And then we had another version of the story where the second sentence doesn't tell us anything at all about robbery, so robbery is new information. And then finally, in this example, robbery is contrastive with vandalism. Okay, so we had 20 of these stories, and we had 32 speakers of American English, and they were asked to read the stories aloud. And first, they read them in a neutral style, and then we asked the, them to read the stories again, speaking in a lively and engaged fashion. We thought we might get more prosodic expression there. Um, and each, each person read, uh, read, read each story in only one of these conditions. Okay. And our predictions were that as we moved up a climb of information structure prominence from given to contrastively focused, we should move up a climb of sort of the pitch accent prominence. And here we're ranking pitch accent prominence. Really, we ended, we had a, a more articulated climb initially, but then we, we ended up retreating to the simple binary distinction because the difficulty of 
labeling this distinction in the data, in the production data, was really tremendous. Uh, and so we felt very secure we could, we could make this reliable distinction, which corresponds to these pitch accent labels in the Toby system. If you're familiar with that, and if you're not, you don't need to worry about that at all. Okay. So, uh, so did we find that? Mm. <laughs> not so much. So what I'm going to show you here is just bar graphs showing you the counts of different kinds of pitch accents under the four different kinds of information structure conditions for our target word. And we had many of these target words when the speaker was, was reading in this neutral way versus when they're reading in this lively way. And the first thing to notice is that the majority of the words were coded as low pitch accent or unaccented. That there was a lot of creaky voice. We actually replicated the experiment to uh, move the target word a little away from the end of the sentence so that we didn't have so much creaky voice. And we still got lots and lots of low, low pitch and unaccented words in all of these conditions. Um, Okay, so nonetheless, there were some interesting differences. The high and, or rising pitch accent was significantly less likely on words that were given, which we predicted, more likely on words that were new, more likely on words that were contrasted. Uh, and this um, effect was even more uh, prominent in um, the lively speech than in the neutral speech. And in fact, over the whole experiment, the, the, the modifications that speakers made to be lively were much more profound, much greater in magnitude than the modifications they made to signal information structure. So if anything, they're really using intonation to expect to express their level of engagement. That's a social factor, a psychosocial factor, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's lurking here and in all of the data and in everything you'll ever look at, with, at least for English. Not just for English. Okay, so we also took acoustic measurements, and I'm just going to whiz through them. There were differences, mainly that words that were in that given condition were acoustically damped relative to other conditions. We didn't find much else, except that words that were spoken in the lively manner were, as you might expect, acoustically enhanced. And that this effect was greater than the effect of information structure. So. Well, we were just mildly disappointed that our results didn't speak more to our research question, but we can't, I can't say we were surprised because we've seen this before. The prosodic encoding of information structure is A, probabilistic, and B, gradient in the acoustics. Probabilistic in the sort of type of pitch accents that are used and gradient in the phonetic implementation. Well, really variable. We've seen this before in, in, in work uh, that, that Eleanor and I did looking at pre-nuclear accents in English. We've seen it before in a, couple, in a study that we did looking at speech that, that is produced outside of the laboratory, and it's been reported for other languages. And I've, I've got some slides on these two. I'm just going to very quickly show you those just to so you know that I'm not making this up. Um, so here's a, a, a layout of some of the uh, findings from our study of a, a, a prominence um, in an English language TED Talk. So this is a, a TED Talk speaker. Uh, who's speaking in a very sort of engaged, motivational style. And we wanted to know how the speaker used pitch accent in relation to information structure. So, so we did a study of his entire uh, TED Talk. And these are the words that are broken down into three information structure categories. And we also separated out names because we had a lot of proper names. Um, and then the color coding is just for the different types of pitch accents that we manually and laboriously labeled, and, and so what you should just see is that these bars are very colorful, meaning that every kind of pitch accent occurs in every kind of information structure condition. Okay, so um, here, and also in this uh, earlier study on German, which I was not involved with, where they, was also a speech production study done in the lab, where they were eliciting words in these different information structure conditions, and labeling the words for different pitch accent types, and you can see that there's, there's variation, except in German, if a word is lexically given, it's not going to receive a pitch accent. And one of the things that I've learned in my work is that even though German and English are very similar, and people like to mark them all together and say these are the Germanic languages with this, this certain kind of intonation system, no, actually not. German doesn't de-accent nearly as much as English does. German de-accents much more consistently than English does. These languages need to be looked at completely uh, separately from one another. Okay. So how do listeners cope with this variation? Um, and I'm going to take you through uh, quickly through four experiments. And I struggled with this. Like I could spend the next 25 minutes on one experiment. But I think 
there's a more interesting story to tell if I try to link together some findings from different experiments to get a bigger, uh, to get sort of the bird's eye, a bird's eye view. But in doing that, I'm not going to give you time to stare at data results graphs, because the, then we won't get through it. I'm going to kind of flash some, but I'm, I want you to focus on the broader narrative and know that I have all the results slides here, and we can linger on them and talk about them later. But we're, I'm not going to slow down that much for them. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about what happens when listeners are uh, interpreting phrasal intonation with discourse context, without discourse context, in relation to stylistic variation, and when we put them in the, the laboratory situation where they have to adapt to unusual, unexpected patterns, what happens? Okay. As I'm going through these four experiments, and you've been warned, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to focus on details. If you really don't understand what I'm talking about, because I didn't say enough, then raise your hand and, and let me just say one thing so that you can, you can follow along. Okay, let's see how this goes. Okay, so. The first experiment I'm going to tell you about is actually uh, well, one of, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, it's one that was just recently published in Language Cognition and Neuroscience. And it, it's really the hard test because it's asking to what extent can listeners identify information structure meaning from phrasal intonation in the absence of information about who the speaker was or what the discourse context was. So this is as far away from the kind of um, uh, materials that Herb is interested in and advocating as, as you can get. But understand that I'm doing this is just to see what information is in the signal when you take away all this other supporting stuff. And then we can look at So prior studies that have tried to ask what listeners get, uh, how is listeners interpret information structure uh, from intonation, give really mixed results. And uh, it's very difficult to extract generalizations because the experiments use different tasks, different response options. And I'm just citing a couple here, a few here, so studies that show that listeners do not reliably distinguish intonation that marks broad focus from narrow focus. Narrow focus is the <coughs> intonation you use when you're answering a specific question uh, when judging the congruence of question-answer dialogues. Uh, and other study, another study showing that, well, um, the position, which word in the sentence is focused, listeners were able to get that. Uh, for English, but not they weren't able to distinguish types of focus or the scope of focus. So this is just a sample uh, to show you that it's been a challenge. So in our study, we had participants judge little dialogues which consisted of a question and an answer, where the prosody of the answer was um, appropriate for the focus condition set up in the question uh, or not appropriate. And then we had them do two different experimental tasks. Both, in both tasks, they were told to choose the dialogue that sounds the most appropriate or natural. So we weren't asking for explicit responses like, where's the focus or what kind of focus? You can't ask people that question. Just choose the dialogue that sounds. And our prediction was that they would choose the dialogue where the intonation was appropriately matched to the question, mm -hmm. focusing the word that, that needs to be focused in order for the answer to be an appropriate answer. Okay, so in one version of this experiment, we offered two dialogues that had the same question, but the answers differed, and they differed in the scope of the focus, which was, uh, which was um, implemented in the intonation, and I'll show you the intonation categories on the next slide. Uh, so they, they would, and, and they didn't read these dialogues, they were just hearing them. So they would just see little icons for speakers, and they would hear, do you know what happened? Yes, Daisy Warren, the owner, or, do you know what happened? Yes, Daisy warned the owner. You would hear things like that. I have to say which one sounded better. Yes, not so much. OK, another version of this experiment, we had, uh, this, again, two dialogues. Uh, but this time, the answers were the same, but the question differed. So we're still assessing congruence, but it's a question of whether they're discriminating on the answer or discriminating on the, on the, the question which sets up the focus condition. No. Yes. OK. We tested the listener's uh, ability to discriminate in, um, in these congruency conditions in a series of micro-experiments that we ran on Mechanical Turk. Each micro-experiment presented a listener with only two intonation patterns that they had, to, and two focus conditions that they had to discriminate. And we did this. This was very different from past work because we wanted to minimize the complexity of the task. Um, so the four focus conditions were the subject, the very simple sentences, subject, verb, object, like Daisy warned the owner. 
Uh, and the subject, the focus conditions were that the subject either had contrastive focus and, and the pitch contours looked like this. These are actual tracings from the stimuli used in our experiment, which were just naturally produced by an informed speaker, somebody from our lab who was not involved in the experiment. Or the subject had narrow focus, so it was like an answer to the question, who warned the owner, and it had this pitch contour. Or it was, the whole sentence had broad focus, like, oh, what happened, what's new? And then it had this pitch contour. Uh, and then, or the whole sentence was given, so it was an answer to, did Daisy warn the owner? Yeah, Daisy warned the owner. Okay. So we had six, so micro experiments, each presenting only a pair of these conditions. So we had six of these micro experiments. Um, Six in, uh, done where the, there were two, uh, one question and two responses, and six experiments where there was two questions, one response. So 12 little experiments that were all done on mechanical turf. Each experiment had 30 participants, and each participant only engaged with 18 trials. They heard nine sentences, nine of these little uh, sentences like Daisy warned the owner, um, which were either congruently matched or, or not congruently matched the focus condition. Um, Okay, so what did we find? So this is just a uh, result summary. This was for, for the experiments that had one question and two prosodic forms. And again, this is a between subject design. So a particular subject only heard you know, 18 of, in this task. Really what they were doing was picking the best prosodic form to answer this question. And overall listeners performed above chance. But accuracy varied a lot depending on which pair of intonation patterns and which pair of focus conditions were being tested. The highest accuracy was for uh, participants who were comparing contrastive focus with given. Uh, that's good, that's like a sanity check. Those two things should be the most different. Also contrastive focus versus broad. We had much lower accuracy in, in these, uh, when, when participants were comparing these focus conditions. This is the results plot. We did a Bayesian model uh, and uh, the dashed line represents uh, chance and each of, this is a summary over all of the uh, experiments done in this paradigm, one question, two prosodic forms, and the way you would read this is that uh, when the contrastive focus was the correct answer, uh, what was the likelihood that they are accurate in choosing it? And, and, over, and, and these three measurements are showing the accuracy on, on the y-axis under the three different um, micro-experiments where contrastive focus was compared with the <coughs> focus, so my hand is shaking too much. Contrastive focus is compared with given, or contrastive focus is compared with narrow. Okay. So, uh, so you can see that it's pretty well above chance. It's pretty high when contrastive focus is being compared with given. Here, given is the correct answer, but it's being compared with contrastive <coughs> focus. Okay. On the other hand, uh, here's uh, here's the the data results for narrow versus contrastive. Or is that right? Or given versus narrow? They're not very accurate there. And really what I want you to see is just that accuracy really varies depending on what the focus, what pair of conditions the listener is trying to discriminate. Okay, so now the second uh, kind of task, we gave them two questions and they had to choose which prosodic form was the best. What they're really doing is saying which question is the most appropriate sort of prompt for this kind of prosody. And this task was a lot more difficult. Accuracy was much lower, even though, bear in mind, it's all the same stimuli. They're hearing exactly all the same intonational forms. Uh, so here what we found is that listeners are biased against matching broad focus prosody with the broad focus question. So here accuracy is, is way below chance. They just never chose this match. They never, they never correctly identified, almost never correctly identified broad focus. Um, and they were biased in favor of matching narrow focus prosody with, with pretty much everything. They really liked that one. <clears throat> so these biases can't, uh, in the paper we discuss the extent to which we can explain these results in, just in terms of the acoustic differences between the different intonation pattern pairs, but they can't get all the way to this explanation, explaining these data based on acoustic differences. So there's more going on that we think reflects the frequency with which these different focus conditions occur in natural, in your natural experience of language, the generalizability of the discourse context, and other stuff that we have, we have no idea about. Okay, yeah. So here's the take home from this experiment. Choosing the best intonational form to express a particular focus-related meaning, easier. Interpreting focus-related meaning from intonational cues in the absence of a real meaningful discourse context, 
much, much harder. Okay, second experiment. This time we're asking, well, what if we provide some supportive discourse context to help listeners interpret international cues to information structure meaning? Good thing to do, right, Herb? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> You're not gonna think my discourse context is very fancy, but the <laughs> discourse context sets up distinctions. In particular, we were interested in distinctions in the predictability of the referent of a word or the importance of this word to the discourse goal, the communication goal. And though these things might be reflected in speakers' choice of intonational patterns, and this has been shown in a really nice study done by the <coughs> researchers using a tic-tac-tac. <coughs> uh, but their study was a production study, and we're asking these questions about listeners. So we test the effects of discourse context on listeners' interpretation of intonational cues to referential meaning. Okay. Um, this is a study, we, we just finished running um, the uh, experiment and it's not written up yet, so we were the last week we presented it for the first time at a regional uh, phonetics phonology meeting and, and you guys are hearing it's almost hot off, the, hot off of the, uh, off of our studio. Um, <laughs> okay, so in this experiment participants are introduced to Jones, who is a, uh, a virtual player in a game and they're going to engage with Jones um, to track the gem that Jones receives on each trial of the game. And so our participants' job is to track the gem that comes out of this gumball machine and then identify it as emerald, topaz, or ruby, and then click the radio button. It's a lot more fun than it looks. Um, <laughs> gems, on most of the trials, gems are identified just by picture, so there's no speech at all. They just get a picture. Oh, Jones got a ruby. Cool, okay. Mm -hmm. Click on ruby and let's keep going. And there's points associated with these, and we incentivize them that they want to try to maximize the correct. They, they, they get the points when they're correct, but the points are subtracted if they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So they want to really be accurate, so at the end of the game, Jones and the player get a lot of points. I mean, didn't reward them for that, but it turns out you don't actually need to. You just need to get points. Um, okay, so um, on some other trials, though, the picture display goes blank, and the virtual player just has to give a verbal cue. Now, the problem with this is that Jones doesn't actually have the vocabulary for these jewels, these gems, and so Jones just says thingy a lot. Okay, and so, but we tell the participant that when this happens, and Jones will say, I got a thingy, you still have to answer what, what gem she got. Um, and listen to the way that, that I, I'm sorry, I'm referring to Jones as a she, but we carefully designed this to be an, uh, gender ambiguous, so it's a they, Jones is a they. Uh, and by piloting in our lab, we felt that this character was slightly ambiguous. Okay, I, I use the pronoun they too for the singular, but I, I lapsed into she. Okay, so the participant is told to listen to the way that the, the sentence is said, and maybe they'll get a clue, and otherwise, good luck, and let's get started. Okay, well, this is um, an example of some of the ways that the, the, the virtual player says the word thingy. Um, I'll let you listen. Uh, now I've got a thingy. Uh, now I've got a thingy. Uh, now I've got a thingy. Okay, so we implemented three different pitch contours, low tone, falling tone, and rising falling tone. Uh, which we and, and other people, present researchers for English, uh, consider to be in a decline of prominence. This is the lowest prominence, usually claimed to be associated with given information. This is our contrastive focus marking pitch accent, and this is supposed to be for like inferable information that under the sort of textbook description. Okay. So there's no feedback. The participant gets no feedback on these thingy trials. We just want to see. Now we ran this study in three different conditions. This is a between subjects condition. So subjects either uh, participated in this game, played this game, when the, the point scores for the three gems were the same, but the gems were skewed in frequency. So rubies are really infrequent, and topaz, topaz, emeralds are the most frequent, and then topaz. Or they were skewed in points, so some of the gems got more points than the others, but their frequency was the same. And they got this visual indicator of the frequency by looking at the gumball machine, which they stared at for the entire, that didn't change, that image didn't change. Or a control group where points and frequency were balanced. And we're manipulating this because we want to see if the predictability of a gem uh, is, if listeners interpret the intonation pattern in relation to the predictability of the gem or in relation to its inherent value, its importance. Mm. So if listeners disregard intonation completely, and they're just guessing on these thingy trials, then we would expect the results to look kind of like this, 
under the players who are, who are in the importance condition where the gem values are varying. Uh, and our question is, are they choosing the low value, mid value, or high value gem in response to the low tone thingy, the falling tone thingy, or the rising tone thingy? We would expect it won't make any difference. They'll just pick whatever they pick. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to respond to the inherent importance. For predictability, uh, we have a little bit clearer of a, uh, expectation uh, since they, if they're tracking the frequency of the gems, they should uh, more often choose the gem that is high frequency and less often choose the gem that's low frequency, but that, that uh, response should be the same regardless of the, the, the tone of the gem, uh, the tone of the word thingy, if they're not paying attention to the tone. I should have said y axis, y -axis is just the proportion of, of selected answers. Okay. So this is one condition of the experiment. This is another condition of the experiment. And I haven't shown you the control condition yet. So these are just predictions. If they're listening, yeah, okay, I was supposed to do that. Um, if they're listening to intonation and interpreting um, thingy in relation to intonation, this is what we predict. In the condition where the intonation uh, varies with the predictability of the gem type, we expect that with the low tone, they'll most often choose the most frequent gem, the, high, the highly predictable gem. But, with, but they'll very rarely choose the low, infrequent, uh, less predictable gem. And furthermore, uh, the opposite, when they do the rising tone, they should very often choose the less predictable gem and very infrequently choose the more predictable gem. And for this, um, in the importance condition, where it's just the point value of the gem that varies, we expect sort of the mirror image of this, right? So with the low tone, they should expect that that's the less important, less valuable gem. And with the rising tone, they should more often choose the more valuable gem. And then the, the, the falling tone, you just expect them to choose the gem that is the, has the medium value or the medium predictability. So that's what we predict. Okay, this next slide I'm going to show you is the results slide, but just like burn this into your eyeballs for a moment, okay? This was the best experiment I have ever run. Oh, oh. I mean, just, this was so far, I spent all the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the results. The results match the prediction, like, this is this, these are the model predictions from our Bayesian model. It's scary how well the results match the prediction. Listeners are doing exact, they are interpreting. I'm exaggerating just a little bit. It's not really scary, but it's exciting. Uh, listeners are interpreting the intonation exactly as we predicted, all differences are significant. And they're getting no the feedback. Hmm? Except for the variability. Well, there's always variability. This, that's a Bayesian model. There's always variability. Right. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here's a control group who heard, uh, they'd heard the three pitch patterns on thingy, but the, the, the experiment was set up so there was no difference among the, the responses, the gem responses for these things, and they, there were no significant differences here. Okay, so here's the take home. Listeners interpret gradient distinctions and accentual prominence in relation to gradient distinctions in importance or predictability of a referent equally well the same signals were mapped onto importance or predictability with equal facility based on the salient meaning dimensions of the discourse. Okay, so next question up. How does stylistic variation affect the way a listener perceives intonation? We, here we examine how prominence is perceived in relation to accent patterns and the acoustic of, of measures of prominence comparing our TED Talk speaker with conversational speech. This one has only one, one results slide to share with you. Um, and the TED Talk speaker sounds like this. A few years ago, I felt like I was stuck in a rut. OK, that's on me. He talks for a long time about how he got himself out of this rut. And if you want to hear the talk and get inspired on his 30-day program to live a better life, <laughs> I'll share with you later. The important thing for us was we just we did labeling of all the pitch accent types for him and in our sample from the Buckeye Corpus of conversational speech. And this is just a simple uh, percent of words showing that he uses a lot of these very dramatic, sweepingly rising pitch accents a lot more than a normal conversational speaker of English would. And he has very relatively fewer uh, unaccented words. And you can kind of hear that in how emphatic he a is. A few years ago. You heard that already. 
Uh, and this is just one of the acoustic measures that confirms our pitch accent labeling also is, is manifest in acoustic signal with higher uh, max F0 of peaks, higher pitch peaks for the speaker compared to the conversational speakers. And now uh, this is the interesting one. We ask listeners to perform a naive prominence rating task where they just listened to the audio from these samples and they had to click they looked at a transcript of, the, of what they were hearing that had no punctuation or capitalization, and they had to click on a word as they heard, in real time as they're listening, if they heard, hear the word as prominent. And then we take the average prominence rating over, say, 30 raters who are doing this task on the same speech materials independently. And then we compare the average prominence, the distribution of those average prominence ratings over all the words in the TED Talk versus all the words in the Buckeye Corpus conversational speech. And what you should see is that these naive listeners give lower word prominence ratings for the TED Talk, discounting the fact that they're more prominent, they're like they have more of these prominent pitch accents and higher pitch, but they rate them, they've calibrated their perception of prominence to, and these were different, different listeners, not the same people doing these two tasks. Not trained, just students at the university. Okay. So, take home. Salience or pitch accents and acoustic prominence depends on contextual factors like speech style and speaker engagement. We'll hear more about this a little bit later on today. And then uh, Chibisa tells us about her, her talk. I fit you in here. You, you might say something different, but we cannot fit you in here. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm kind of getting out of time, but I had one more experiment to show you, so I'll take a couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is the experiment. This is maybe, well, this is the experiment where we're asking, can listeners adapt to, to interpret intonation patterns which are not, they're not already familiar to them from their knowledge of English, but they should gain familiarity to them through the course of our experiment, and can they interpret them uh, accordingly? Especially intonation patterns which in English are, are considered ornamental, and I'll tell you in just a minute what those intonation patterns are. The, so can they interpret them as cues to information structure meaning? So in English, pitch accents that pre, I've talked a lot about the nuclear stress and the pitch accent that comes at the end of the sentence, but at the very first slide I showed you, and I had you listen to that little sample from the Buckeye Corpus, and you might remember the pitch accent had a few wiggles on it, and there were a few words I picked up as being sounding prominent, but to me, uh, only one of them was the nuclear pitch accent. So what were the others? They all preceded the nuclear, and so they were the pre-nuclear pitch accents. And in English, pre-nuclear pitch accents are considered optional. Some people describe them as ornamental. They're not strongly associated with focus or information status. And this has been shown in, in our lab and in other people's work as well, especially Sasha Kelvin's work. So here's an example of a sentence. I'll just read it aloud to you. The word vacation is the, is the nuclear stress that has the nuclear pitch accent in a normal, out of the blue reading. So Jay wants to visit Berlin and Stuttgart during summer vacation. So I made up this example sentence for a talk I was giving in Stuttgart. <laughs> uh, but I can also say, I can also add pre nuclear accents to these words. Jay wants to visit Berlin and Stuttgart during summer vacation. That's fine. Or I can, if I'm feeling really happy, I can check some more words. Jay wants to visit Berlin and Stuttgart during summer vacation. I know I start to sound like one of those motivational speakers, a <laughs> radio announcer or something like that. But these are all fine. They're, they're perfectly acceptable ways to say this sentence. To listen, and, and the choice between you know, accenting or not accenting these pre-nuclear words is, doesn't bear on the interpretation of those words as being new or not to the discourse or whatever, it doesn't. So my question is, do listeners even notice? Do they pay attention to these non-informative pre-nuclear accents? And can they learn to associate them with referential meaning if that association is demonstrated to be consistent, where it's not generally in the language, but we can set up conditions where it is? Can they learn? So we tested that in a visual world experiment with mouse tracking, uh, leaning very heavily on an innovative uh, research, uh, experimental paradigm that Chibusa developed, and it, which you can read about in her paper. We've done something slightly different with it. Um, so uh, listeners were instructed, this is a visual world paradigm, so they're going to hear speech and be looking at a computer screen, and they're going to have to indicate the answer to a question. Um, this has been done in, in Chibusa's lab with eye tracking. We're doing it with mouse tracking. Okay. So, uh, for example, they're going to be instructed that there's a fantasy shifter, a fantasy creature called a wuggy that can shape shift into all kinds of objects. 
and two speakers are conversing about which one of these objects the wuggy has become. In the control conditions, listeners will hear a question like this. What does a wuggy look like? And on the next screen, they're going to hear an answer to that question with a lexically specified referent. The one on the screen looks like a beaver. Mm. Okay, now these sentences are naturally produced, but we've resynthesized the pitch on all of them, so they, they sound maybe just a little bit different. Okay, but there's that. When, then, the, the, then the listener hearing, the participant hearing that second sentence should then move the mouse and click on the beaver. It's not a very hard job. Uh, now, in, uh, in these examples, these are kind of the control conditions, there's no discourse context that, that will help listeners know which which word they're going to click on, beaver in this case. They just have to wait for the lexical item beaver to occur, and then they, they click on it. And there's a default nuclear pitch accent on the object in these conditions. No early cue to the referent. But on other trials, the critical trials, listeners will hear a discourse setting question that introduces a referent. In this case, it's the beaver. Did the wuggy become a beaver? And then they hear an answer that either confirms this proposition or introduces a con contrastive reference. So here's the confirming one. The one on the screen looks like a beaver. Mm. So then they should click on beaver or... The one on the screen looks like a window. And then they should click on a window. Mm. So whether the reference is given or contrastive is systematically marked by different intonation contours. So when the sentence confirms the referent that is given from the question, listeners will hear a rise fall in pitch on the verb. This is a verum focus intonation pattern, uh, and um, the listener should be familiar with this pattern from English. You can say the one on the screen looks like a beaver. That's a that's a an intonation pattern in English that has that is used. Um, but when the sentence introduces a referent, oh, and in this case, um, the listener actually gets an early clue, an early cue here from the pitch movement on the verb uh, that they should click on the beaver. They don't actually need to wait to hear beaver. If they're paying attention to the intonation, they should know that when they hear the pitch accent on looks, they can go ahead and click on beaver because that's what the answer is going to be, the given referent. On the other hand, when the sentence introduces a referent that contrasts with the one mentioned in the question, the listeners will hear this pre-nuclear rise fall on the sentence subject. Um, and uh, the prenuclear cue then becomes available uh, very early in the utterance, giving listeners a lot of time to integrate that information and anticipate the click, that they should click on the, the referent that was not mentioned in the question. So they can start to move the mouse towards the referent very early in this condition if they pick up on the association between this prenuclear pitch accent and the contrastive status of the referent. They should also be able to take advantage of this somewhat less early cue in this condition. So what do you think? <laughs> Does the listener click the correct referent upon hearing these early cues? Even the pre-nuclear uh, accent, which is supposed to be just ornamental, just decoration and not meaningful at all in English. Can they learn it? We thought not, maybe. Okay. So <coughs> yeah, I'm not, we're not going to spend time looking at this slide. Okay. Here's the cartoonified version of those results. Uh, a yellow indicates the point in the, in the audio uh, presentation where we observe a turn in the mouse trajectory towards the target. Okay, so in this condition, as expected, they can't turn towards the target, the beaver, until they hear the word beaver. So that's where that's where that happens. Uh, when they hear the um, the verb, uh, sorry, that doesn't matter. Okay, so in the verb condition, um, they actually do take into account this early pitch accent information, and the turn towards the target comes shortly after, about 200 milliseconds after the verb. So they're hearing that pitch accent and saying, aha, I know what that's going to be. That's going to be the beaver. Um, and when, but interestingly, when they hear uh, the pre-nuclear accent on the, on the subject, they, don't, they, they, do, they do move early, earlier than the... Here's the lexical uh, reveal of what they should be clicking on. They, they do anticipate the answer, the correct answer, but they're not doing it back here. They're doing it in the region of the verb. So what they're doing is hearing that there is no big pitch accent on the verb, so that means that it's not going to be the beaver, it's going to be the other thing. They're responding to the absence of the nuclear pitch accent on the verb. They are not really responding to the presence of the pre-nuclear pitch accent on the subject. Okay, so we saw that, we're like, yes, that's, that's what we predicted. These ornamental pitch accents don't mean anything in English. 
But my co-author, Timo Rotger, uh, who's my postdoc, he, he's very serious about uh, the statistical modeling of these data. These data were modeled, we used a Bayesian model, but he wanted to take a deeper dive and ask, well, what's really happening at the level of individual participants here? Results suggest, yeah, okay, so what I just said, comparing responses at the beginning and the end of the experiment, who were looking at learning, did they learn this? Where did they, where did they begin to learn it? We found that some listeners actually did learn to respond to the premium of their accent early in both conditions. The less, slightly less than half of the listeners made good use of this early cue. And the other half, they ignored it completely. So you put them all together in the Bayesian model and you get what looks like something kind of in the middle. Uh, but that's what we found, individual differences. So the take home, typically ornamental pre-nuclear accents are initially disregarded, but, but, but they can learn, some listeners can learn to attend to them as a cue to downstream preferential status. Okay, so these are, this is a recap over all of the uh, experimental findings. Um, the, the, the real one-liner is that context matters a lot and listeners can adapt to the discourse setting and the style of the speaker. So intonational meaning is not inherent in the intonational features themselves. Pitch accents are not pragmatic morphemes. Nothing, none of our results support the claim that pitch accents are pragmatic morphemes. Rather, the interpretation is specific to the context, may not be interpreted specific to the speaker and the style. So I think a different way that we might begin to think about the intonational prominence is that its core function, including pitch accents, is to guide listeners' attention, signaling the relative distinctions in the informativity of words and, phra of words and phrases as determined by the speaker in relation to the context. <coughs> You're going to hear, I think, more uh, sort of comments, I think, that, that relatively support this. Where is, where is this person who's giving a talk later today? Okay, later today. Um, and it turns out that I'm not the first person to come to this idea. After I came to this idea, I, I came upon this very nice paper by Dean Rand Bellman, who proposed the prominence principle. It says, if one expression is more communicatively significant than another expression, the first should be more surface prominent than the second which is another way, I think, of saying the same thing, but they didn't do the experimental work to explore what communicatively significant means. Okay, so meaning is not inherent in intonational features. I just said that on the last slide. And now here's where I have to say, well, but sometimes it is, and it may come to be so through conventionalization in the language. So if I, if I ask you to read out this telephone number, uh, if I say, okay, I'm going to read out this telephone number, it's one, two, three, four, five, five, seven, eight, nine, zero, and you have to correct me. How are you going to do it if you're an English speaker? Huh? Go ahead. Yes. Gail Jefferson says you emphasize the six. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. So the way that we do the six would be very similar across speakers of English. They're going to use that sharply rising pitch accent increased loudness, increased duration. It's actually very conventionalized how you use intonation to correct something. If you can't use syntax, and here, you can't use syntax, you can't change the word order here in a digit string correction. Okay, so this is very, yeah, this correcting intonation is quite conventionalized in English. You don't have to do it, but if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it the same way that other people are gonna do it. Uh, so I think that this might be the source of contra a more generalized use of contrastive focus in English, uh, but it's not as conventionalized in contrastive focus as it is in correction. Okay, so another thing that, that, that I think we need to think more about is individual listener differences. I, I showed that a tiny, tiny bit at the end of my presentation of the last experiment. Uh, and we know that there are individual listener differences in attention to intonation, we observe them in the lab, which makes you wonder what's going on in the real world. There almost certainly are also individual differences there. What are the implications for pragmatic processing and social behavior and so on and so forth. Thank you. So I just want to really like the previous action thing, but one thing I'm wondering is with the synthesized um, sort of sound you mentioned. Resynthesized. Resynthesized. Mm -hmm. yes, we, A big difference. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I wonder, did Pete, how natural did people feel the voices sounded? Because sometimes when you hear synthesized sounds, yeah. you think, well, you know, the intonation's a bit kind of weird anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah, we always norm we always we always do a sanity check on them in our lab and then we do an order if there's any question and there really weren't were questions. I mean, if you ask people, can you tell the difference between just not resynthesized and resynthesized? Sometimes they can tell the difference, but they don't they don't sound uh, too long. Or if they do, we, we keep working with the resynthesis. They are resynthesized, but we do that so that we, we can make sure that the intonation pattern on different text is actually the same because that's the objective of the testing. But yeah, so in some experiments, we actually tell We've used the, the model where we tell people that uh, we're, we're trying to improve computer speech synthesis. And so you're going to hear a computer voice say these, say these things in English and tell us where, what we need to make better. 